Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. Put it up on the screen for those here in the building with us. The word of the Lord today reads from the King James text. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound in unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, meaning Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Jesus. Oh God, the Word of God declares your name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Lord, you are wonderful to us. We're grateful today, God. Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Oh, Jesus, we're grateful, God, for the Holy Ghost. We're grateful for the anointing. I feel a sweet anointing. Oh, coming down to make me clean like a mighty rushing stream. Oh, sweet. Yes, sweet anointing Coming down like oil and wine All over me Oh, Jesus, Jesus We stand in your presence, God, I'm so glad Oh, I'm so glad to be able to stand in your presence, Jesus. God in an age, Idara Boba Rosho Kandabaraya Kakaya Namahando, Itaraba Sitaye Kamaha. Oh, God. Who glory in an age, Lord, where so many are walking away from the Holy Ghost. In an age, God, when so many are walking away from the move of God. In an age, God, when so many are Oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh Master, loose the Holy Ghost at this hour. God, I feel an anointing I wasn't expecting. I wasn't expecting, Lord, this kind of anointing 
for this message, but I believe, God, you want to send a powerful word to the people of God. Oh, God, thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you for the power of God. Let the word of the Lord go forth with power and with might in the authority of the Holy Ghost. In the power of Jesus' name, perform the work, God, that you would send it forth to perform. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, deliver from demons at this hour. Save those that are lost, reclaim the backslider. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Whoo! Glory. Hallelujah. Oh, oh my God, have mercy. Every once in a while. Oh my God. Every once in a while, the anointing is just overwhelming. And that's what I feel today. I wasn't, expect, I wasn't expecting this today. But God must be wanting to communicate something to somebody today. Glory. Hallelujah. 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 You know, God is a great God. Yes. There's an old song they sing in the black church. God is a good God. Oh, yes, He is. God is a good God. Oh, yes, He is. I want to tell you, God is a great God. Oh, yes, He is. God is a great God. Nothing the Lord does is by accident. Nothing the Lord does is by happenstance. There are so many factors that go into those things which the Lord does in the Word of God. It's not even funny. We read about the conversion of a Pharisee named Saul. Saul was about as devout a Jew as anyone can get. He was so devout, he was radical. We've got a lot of Christians so-called in the church today who are a lot like Saul. They're so religious and so devout, <coughs> so committed to their religion mm -hmm. that they're radicalized. Man, they kill for their faith. Now, isn't that funny because you would think that loving God and having a relationship with the Lord and believing the Word of God, you would think that being willing to see someone die simply because they don't do things the way you think they ought to be done or they don't believe exactly the way you think they ought to believe, you would think that a willingness to see them die for that would be outside of the parameters of somebody who's supposed to be so devout and so sincere and so committed to their faith. You know, you've got to understand the Word of God taught treat to love your neighbor as yourself long before the New Testament came along. That was not a teaching that we only find in the New Testament. No, in the Old Testament, in the law of Moses, they were taught to love their neighbor as they love themselves. That is why within the context of the law of Moses... When someone immigrated into Israel, when someone became part of the nation of Israel from other nations and other countries, according to the law of God, they were to be treated as though they were natural born citizens. They were not to be treated differently. They were not to be uh, approached differently. You were not to take advantage of them. You were not uh, to treat them poorly. But you were supposed supposed to treat people who were not even born. Now listen, if they weren't born in Israel, if they were not part of the Jewish people, then there's a good chance their skin color might be different. There was a good chance their religion might be different. There was a good chance that their culture might be different. And yet for all of that, the law of God, the law that God gave the nation of Israel, stated that 
foreigners, referred to in the Word of God as strangers, immigrants, were to be treated as natural-born citizens. They were to be treated as though they were a citizen just like every other citizen of the nation. We've got people running around in America today claiming that they want America to be a Christian nation. They want America to follow the Word of God. No, you don't, you lying idiot, and don't tell me you do. Because if you wanted the nation, this nation to live up to God's standard for a nation, then you would follow the law that God gave to the nation of Israel. Am I telling the truth? Yes, yes. And I've got news for you, honey. Your ideas about the sick are not in keeping with God's ideas about the sick. Your ideas about the poor are not in keeping with God's ideas about the poor. Right. Your ideas about immigrants and people seeking refuge, refugees, is not in keeping with what the Word of God teaches a nation. How a nation ought to behave toward refugees. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Don't stand there and lie and tell me you're garbage. That, oh, we believe, hallelujah, Americans are Christian nation, hallelujah. We ought to live according to the standard of God's word, glory, hallelujah. Liar. Liar. You use the word of God as you choose to use it. You twist it, you That's pervert right. it. You make it say what you want it to say. You apply it when you want to apply it. And you ignore it when you want to ignore it. And I've got a word for you today. The word of the Lord teaches us in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, the man we're talking about today, said that if you offend at one point of the law, then you have offended at every point of the law. So unless you're planning on keeping the law in its entirety, don't you dare come trying to push at me one issue or another that comes from the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. You see, S S Saul was a devout Pharisee. He was about as devout and as radical as anybody could be. But you know, the interesting thing is, as radical as Saul was, as devout as he was, he didn't know God anywhere near like he thought he knew God. He didn't have a relationship with God anywhere near like he thought his relationship was. He was trying his best to embrace and to adhere to and to live up to the law of Moses. He was doing everything in his power to live up to that law. But yet, he still had no concept of God. Mm -hmm. God had already come to earth, revealed himself as a baby in a manger, grown to full adulthood, grown to the full stature of a man walked this planet for three and a half years teaching and performing miracles as evidence of his divinity. Saul never had opportunity to see Jesus. He never had opportunity to know Jesus. He never had an opportunity to have an encounter with God manifest in the flesh. All Saul knew was the law. I'm going to tell you something. There are too many people in the church today. They call themselves born again. They call themselves children of God. They call themselves knowing the Lord. But honey, they have never had an encounter with God manifest in the flesh. Hallelujah. They have never had an encounter with the Lord. They don't know the God they claim to serve. They're so busy trying to follow some law. They're so busy trying to follow the rules that they they are strangers to the God they claim to know and serve. Mm -hmm. But Saul had a Damascus Road moment. On his way to Damascus, where he had received authority from the chief priests in Jerusalem, if there be any that are called Christians in Damascus who are coming into the synagogues who are going about their city preaching this 
Jesus Rabbi that we've put to death and we want his message squelched. If there be any that follow that way, it's described in the passage we read today. And they, Paul had, uh, Saul had the authority to take them bound back into Jerusalem where they would be tried according to religious law and they could be declared heretics and stoned to death. I'm going to tell you, God does everything for a reason. There's a reason that the Lord shared Saul's conversion experience with us in the Word of God. It goes way beyond what you might think. There is so much more to be gleaned from this story. At some point in the life of every believer... We must experience an encounter with the Lord, listen to me, that rocks our world and challenges, listen to me now children, challenges everything we thought we knew and everything we thought we understood about God and about his grace. Let me repeat that. At some point in our life, every one of us has to have an encounter with God that rocks our world and makes us rethink and reevaluate what we know about God and what we know about His love and what we know about His grace. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You see, this is what happened to Saul on the road to Damascus. Everything he knew about God, everything he thought he knew about God, suddenly was called into question. He looks up into the sky, this light shining down upon him, hearing a voice. He saw something that those riding in the caravan with him didn't see. He saw, hallelujah, the risen Christ. He saw the resurrected Jesus. He saw God manifested physically before his eyes in the light. And he asked the question, Who art thou, Lord? He knew this has to be God, because I'm going to tell you a little secret. There isn't a Jew on the planet that would address anything or anyone as Lord except for God. Talk to a Jewish rabbi and ask him. Mm -hmm. Ask him. Will a Jew, will they ever say Jesus is Lord? Of course not, because in their mind, in their understanding, that means you're saying Jesus is God. You see, we got people in the Western world, we got people who read the Bible from a Westernized perspective who don't understand that to say Jesus is Lord is identical, it is the same exact thing as saying Jesus is God. God, because according to uh, uh, Hebraic teaching and belief, according to the Old Testament, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, meaning the Lord and God are one and the same. Therefore, you can't call anybody Lord except you're calling them God. You can't say anybody's God except you're acknowledging them as Lord. At some point in our lives, everybody has to have an encounter with God that causes us to rethink everything we thought we knew, everything we thought we understood about God and His grace. Saul was a man of faith. He was a religious man. He had a great deal of zeal. He had a great amount of passion for his faith. When he was stopped on the road to Damascus by a great light, and as he heard the voice of God coming from that light, he knew it was God speaking. And he declared suddenly, recognizing, I don't know as much as I thought I knew. Suddenly, he said, you notice he didn't say, oh, great Jehovah, oh, great Yahweh. So what he said, is it? What did he say? He said, who art thou, Lord? 
See, all of a sudden he realized, I don't know as much as I think I know. I, I'm, not, I'm not as much in the know as I thought I was. I thought I knew everything about God there was to know. If anybody on the planet was supposed to know God's name, it was the Jewish people. Am I telling the truth, Tommy? Yes. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you. If anybody on the earth knew what God's name was, it was the Jews. Right. So why didn't he address them by name? Why instead did he say, Who art thou, Lord? Because, honey, this encounter rocked him. This encounter caused him to call into question everything he thought he knew, everything he thought he understood. All of a sudden, he realized he had more questions than answers. Lord, I need you to fill me in on some things because apparently I've got a lot of blanks on my test here. Got a lot of questions I can't answer. Got a lot of things I thought I understood. But apparently I don't. Who art thou? And the voice came from heaven. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. It didn't come back saying I'm Jehovah. It didn't come back saying I'm Yahweh. It didn't come back saying I'm Adonai. No, the, the voice spoke from heaven and said, I am Jesus. Hallelujah. Honey, when you finally have an encounter with God and you finally find out His name, you Amen. Hallelujah! There is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. Glory to God. God gave him a name which is above every name. That includes Adonai. That includes Jehovah. Gave him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess. Oh, hallelujah. What? What will every knee bow and every tongue confess? That Jesus Christ is Lord, hallelujah. Oh my God, have mercy. Like Saul, there are many people of faith in our world today who may be devout, they may be passionate about their faith, but sadly, they are at the same time misguided and headed in a very wrong direction. The only hope they have to correct their course and to get on the right track is to have a Damascus moment. <laughs> Hallelujah. An encounter with the Lord that challenges and ultimately changes all they thought they knew about grace and God's requirement, His requirements of them in this life. Oh, my God, have mercy. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I thank God for Damascus moment. I've had mine. You've had yours. Some of y'all say, no, I haven't. I've never had a Damascus moment. Hang in there a minute. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to fill you in a second so you'll understand. Oh, yes, you have. If you're watching this preacher preach today and you have any knowledge of the LGBT affirming Holy Ghost message we preach, then believe me, you had to have had a Damascus moment at some point in your life. You had to have an encounter with the Lord at some point in your life that made you stop and question everything you thought you knew about God and His grace and His love for you. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. See, for some of us, our Damascus moment comes when we're trying to reconcile our faith with who we are. Oh my goodness, LGBT believer. Oh, I'm going to tell you, as long as you're trying to satisfy the law, 
As long as you're trying to live by the rules, as long as you're trying to earn your way into heaven, as long as you're trying to follow all the edicts and all the mandates that First Holiness Church throws at you, or as long as you're trying to follow all the edicts and all the mandates that First Fundamentalist Church throws at you, as long as you're trying to work your way into heaven, you have not yet had an encounter with Jesus. You have not yet had an encounter with the Lord that, that amounts to a Damascus moment. Because honey when you have a Damascus moment you suddenly are going to fall on your knees and say Lord I need you to reveal yourself to me. I'm in conflict. I'm in torment. I don't know what to believe. I don't know where to look. I don't know what to do. And you need God to reveal himself to you. You need the Lord to help you understand grace. It's not about the law. Oh, everything Saul thought he knew was wrong. I'm going to tell you something, honey. You can be devout till gold chips fall out of your butt and it don't make you right. Sure. You can have all the energy and all the enthusiasm and all the passion and all the you know, strength to run and act the fool all you want to. It does not make you right. As a matter of fact, the people who are the wrongest are usually the ones who are running the fastest. Mm -hmm. The ones who are most wrong are usually the ones who are screaming at the top of their lungs. Hello now, mm -hmm. got news for you. The ones who are most wrong without fail are going to affect and influence the greatest number of people. Because the truth of the gospel, the truth of grace, works against human nature. Human beings think that it is impossible for somebody to give you something for free that you haven't done anything for, that you have not earned, and that they would not expect you to give something back in return. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. The other day, Tommy and I went to the mall. I was, uh, we went by a little kiosk that sold all these fancy little face masks, you know. Now, we wear face masks when we go out. And we were wearing face masks, but they had these nice cloth face masks, a bunch of different decorations on them or what have you. And Tommy stopped and we started looking at them. We decided to buy a couple. Well, I went to try one on that I had bought for myself, and don't you know, my big old fat preacher head was too big. I couldn't get the strap around the back to go, you know, it was real cute. It kind of had a military uh, pattern on it, you know, camouflage pattern on it. Had a little vent on it and everything. And I thought, well, you know what, this probably be better for a kid than for me because it won't go around my head. So at one point, Tommy was doing a business with I Place, getting some new glasses. I walked out into the mall and was kind of walking around. This young lady come by. She had a son, probably about 10. And I said to her, I said, young lady, I, said, I just bought this mask at the store over here, at the kiosk over here. I said, I did try it on. So you might want to maybe spray some Lysol in it first before you let your son wear it or something. I said, but I'll give it to you for free if you'd like. I said, because, you know, I can't use it. I'd be, just, I'd be just happy for him to have it. And she looked at me and she said, no, thank you. Now, she might have been more worried about his health. I don't know what her issue was. But, you know, there's a lot of people who have the attitude. Ain't nobody giving away something for nothing. There has to be some ulterior motive. There has to be something. Maybe he trying to kill off people of color because this particular lady was black. Maybe he trying to kill off people of color and he handed out masks that are poison, you know, because people have all kind of ideas, you know. And, and I understand, unfortunately, I understand where some of that comes from. But my point is, it's hard for us to accept that God could go to the lengths he went Putting the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary to die for us and then to offer us salvation by grace simply in response to our faith in what he's done for us. 
He doesn't ask us to be perfect. He doesn't ask us to be sinless. He doesn't ask us to never make a mistake or never trip or fall. No. He says, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to walk in relationship with me. I'd like you to love me and let me love you back. And you know what? Uh, he doesn't even have to tell us this, but I'm telling you, when you walk in relationship with the Lord and you love Him and He loves you back, things change. You do things differently than you used to do them. You don't do them because God demands you do them. You do them simply because of your relationship with the Lord. You can't walk in relationship with Jesus and be out there getting drunk every night. You can't walk in relationship with the Lord and be out there getting high every night. You can't walk in relationship with the Lord and be out there sleeping with everybody every night. No. I'll tell you why. Because, not because you run around terrified God will send you to hell. But when you love the Lord, honey, I'm going to tell you something. There's something in you that makes you want to act right. There's something in you that makes you want to live right. There's something in you that begins to conform, listen to me now, to God's law. But you're doing it in response to love, not in response to a demand. Do you follow what I'm telling you? It's that simple. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you start to look like Him. You know, you've heard you've heard the old saying that relationships, the longer people in relationship with one another, the more they start to look alike. I've noticed I've gotten at least a shade or two darker since Tommy and I have been together. It'll be 20 years in December. I think another 20 years, I'm going to be a full-blown African-American man. So, <laughs> No, that's goofy, of course. But, well, I'll tell you, I get a chuckle out of listening to Tommy sometimes talk because there's a whole lot of phrases and a whole lot of ways of saying things that I know for a fact he didn't use when I first met him. But he's been around me long enough now that it cracks me up because he'll say something and I'm sitting there on the inside, not on the outside, on the inside I'm grinning because I know I rubbed off on him. You can't walk with the Lord and not want to be like it. You can't be in love with somebody and not want to do those things which please them. You can't be in love with somebody and listen to me and not want to not do those things which displease them. Am I telling the truth? You love somebody and you know that they hate when you sit there and shove your finger up your nose to the knuckle and you're sitting there trying to pull out a booger that's giving you a hard time, somebody's saying, oh, preacher, that's gross. I, it is, but it's at the same time humorous. I'm trying to make a point here. You know, some people, they just stick their finger up their nose, you know. And boy, you can't stand that. And, and if you and I are in a relationship and I know you can't stand that, then there's a good probability that if I do that at all, I'm certainly not going to do it in front of you. Do you understand what I'm telling you? There are things you do. You make changes. You make adjustments because of your relationship. You don't do it because your partner says, If you do that one more time, I won't leave you. Although I've heard that a time or two. <laughs> no, you make changes. You make adjustments. Why? Because you're in love with somebody. And your heart's desire is to make them happy. Your heart's desire is to please them. So you adjust and you change the way you do things. The same is true when we walk in relationship with Jesus. But grace is a hard thing to digest. It's a hard thing to understand. The gospel does not easily reveal itself to people because it completely contradicts human nature. For some of us, we have our Damascus moments when we are trying to reconcile our LGBT orientation in our faith in Jesus Christ. Some people, they have their moment, Tommy, when it comes to divorce. A lot of folks out there today, you've been married. You never dreamed in a million years your marriage would end. You thought you'd be married forever because after all, that's the way you believed. 
all of a sudden you get hit with divorce and all of a sudden you're standing there saying Lord who are you I'm lost I I, everything I thought I knew, all of a sudden I'm worried because if it's all about following the rules, then I'm up a creek. If it's about earning salvation, then I'm up a creek. If it's about being perfect, then I'm up a creek. Am I telling the truth now? And it's when that divorce comes that all of a sudden we have our Damascus moment and we find ourselves on our knees looking up toward heaven and saying, Lord, I need a new revelation. I need a new understanding. you got to help me better understand your salvation. you got to better help me understand your grace. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? You see, I told you a little while ago, all of us have had a Damascus moment at some point in our life and some of y'all questions and no I've never had one Ah, now not everybody has the Damascus moment in response to divorce not everybody has the Damascus moment in response to coming out not everybody has the Damascus moment because of a, a certain issue in their life that they just get bowled over by that just overtakes them and all of a sudden they find themselves desperately needing. You know, it amazes me how many people have certain attitudes toward LGBT people or LGBT issues. And then all of a sudden their daughter or their son comes out. And a few months later, you're talking to that same person, and boy, their attitudes have changed. Their opinions have changed. All of a sudden, they look at things very different. I remember my aunt once telling me, she said, did you read about that politician? She said, he was so anti-gay and so against gay people, and boy, he was just having a fit. She said, and all of a sudden, his son come out and said, boy, now you ought to hear him. Oh, everything's changed now. All of a sudden now, yeah. We'll see, now everything hadn't really changed. All that's changed is his understanding. The truth was there the whole time. He just wasn't willing to accept the truth until it affected him personally. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I'm going to tell you, Saul wasn't willing to face. He was fighting the gospel with everything he had. He didn't want to obey the gospel until it hit him right between the eyes, stopped him on the road and said, Hey, why are you giving me grief? Why are you coming against me? All of a sudden Saul understood, wait a minute, this gospel then must indeed be associated with God because mm -hmm. the Lord's talking to me. There's a lot of people out there today who need a Damascus moment. You know what? They need an issue to come into their life that stops them dead in their tracks and makes them look up toward heaven and say, Who art thou, Lord? I remember Brother King at the Riverside Church of God, Dewey King and his wonderful wife, beautiful Christian Pentecostal holiness people. Years and years and years ago, many decades ago, he said, we heard the gospel, we heard about the Lord, we heard about the born-again experience. He said, but my wife and I just weren't interested. He said, then all of a sudden, my oldest son happened, uh, was still a kid, just, I think he was about five or six or something. And this back in the day before they had child-proof locks, you know, on the back door of the cars, and back before we even wore seatbelts as a rule. And his son, somehow or another, accidentally opened the car door while they were driving down the freeway, fell out of the car, was mortally wounded, desperately wounded. They got him to the hospital and the doctors told him, said, we, we don't think he's going to survive. We don't think he'll live. Brother King said, all of a sudden, now he didn't use these words, listen to me, but this is what he was saying. He said, all of a sudden, I had my Damascus moment. All of a sudden, I was looking up toward heaven saying, Lord, I need you to show me who you are and I need to show you who you are fast. Everything I thought I knew, I don't know anymore. Everything I thought I understood. I thought at death we just died and disappeared and there was nothing after death. All of a sudden now I'm beginning to wonder if that's so. 
Do you follow what I'm telling you? He began to question everything. And he went into the, the, the uh, chapel at the hospital and he began to pray. And long story short, they wound up becoming part of Riverside Church of God and receiving the Holy Ghost and serving the Lord for many, many, many years and died loving Jesus and living for the Lord. But he had his Damascus moment. Many of us today, oh, we're living our life and we've got our foot on the gas. We're going at full speed. Some of, uh, some of us are going full speed with religion behind us and some of us are going full speed without religion. But we're going full speed, just like Saul. I'm here to tell you, whatever the catalyst today for your Damascus moment, the end result will be a whole new way of seeing and understanding the Lord and the role that His grace plays in our lives. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, the Apostle Paul, the same man who had this conversion experience on the road to Damascus, after his conversion, he changed his name. In olden days, a lot of times when you kind of wanted a new start, you know, you wanted to start fresh, you just changed your name. So instead of calling himself Saul, he began to call himself Paul. And Paul wrote these words, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations. You see, God was giving Paul an awful lot of revelations and visions and dreams. And uh, he was giving him a crash course on everything that transpired in the life of the Lord and uh, all of this. Paul, Saul went away for three years. After his conversion, he didn't run straight to Jerusalem and hook up with the other apostles. He literally went off for three years and it was just him and the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of the Lord showed him many, many things. Well, those things could have made him full of himself. Having all that revelation and all that understanding from God could have made him proud and prideful. And this is why he wrote, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he, meaning the Lord, said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You know what, you know what Paul was saying? He was saying, every time I have a Damascus moment, because you don't just have one, you have them throughout the course of your walk with God, throughout the course of your, they have to be reminded every once in a while. A weakness comes along that troubles us. We've got sin in our life. We've got a weakness in our life. We keep doing something stupid that we know it's a child of God. We really ought not to be doing it. And we keep having to have Damascus moments over and Oh Lord, I wish you'd take this away from me. Oh Lord, I wish you'd deliver me from this. I wish you'd deliver me. Oh God, I wish this wasn't an issue I had to face in my life. I wish this was something I didn't constantly keep doing. And the Lord has to keep saying, hey, my grace is sufficient. See, when you're weak, I'm strong. See, when you're weak, oh hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you're weak, that's when I carry you. See, you keep worrying. You keep thinking this thing's all about you. You keep thinking this thing's all on your strength. You keep thinking that if you can't do it, it won't be done. I'm here to tell you, when you can't do it, I'm doing it for you. Hallelujah! Woo! Glory 
children of God. Got to have them Damascus moment reminders. Every once in a while. Every once in a while, we got to be thrown back to the ground. We got to look back up into the light and say, Lord, fix my thinking. Help me to think right. Help me to understand this thing right. Amen. We had a fellow in the church for years, Brother Martin, and he said to me, he loved when I preached on grace. He said, every time you preach on grace, he said, man, I'm telling you, it just, it just lights my world up. Helps me to understand things I've never understood before. He said, please just preach on grace every once in a while. Just preach that, preach in that thing. Well, of course I do, but it's because the Holy Ghost directs me to, not because Martin asked me to. But you see, the point is, he knew I need those Damascus moments. I need those moments where I'm reminded of who God is. I'm reminded of how God is. I'm reminded that it's not the works of the law that are going to save my soul, but it's my faith in a living God that's going to do the work. Hallelujah. One of the most terrible abuses of the gospel of Jesus Christ has long been the false message of change and transformation listen to me that is supposed to come upon conversion how many of us have had somebody come to us and with all the judgmental garbage they could stir up they looked in the eyes and said well the Bible says Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Former things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Sometimes that people come at me with that. I want to look at them and say, Well, when you went to the altar, you're an idiot. When you come up from the altar, you're an idiot. Mm hmm. Did your IQ change? Did your eye color change? Did your hair color change? Did your height change? Did your stature change? Did your weight change? Well, of course not. Um, the Bible said all things are become new. The Bible says you're a new creature. All things are become new. Don't you stand there and tell me I shouldn't be gay anymore because I'm a child of God that that should have changed if I was really saved. Don't you stand there and give me that garbage. Got news for you. When the Word of God said you're a new creature, everything changes. Let me, let me explain that to you. You are a new creature. Because God now, according to the word of the Lord, now you're living by faith rather than by sight. Now you're supposed to have the mind of Christ. Do you know what having the mind of Christ does to a believer? Listen carefully now. It changes the way you look at everything. Mm -hmm. You're a new creature. All things become new. Does that mean everything about you has become new? No. It means the way you see everything is new. Now, the way you look at everything, you look at it differently than you used to look at it before. So now it's brand new to you. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? As a child of God, we don't look at things the way the world looks at things. We don't see things the way the world sees things. Everything, as a believer, when we become born again, everything becomes new to us. Am I telling the truth? Don't stand there and tell me, Oh, bless God, there ain't no more sin in your life. Once you're a child of God, there ain't no more sin in your life unless you go out and sin. Oh, you ain't going to do wrong unless you go out and do wrong, you liar. That is not the word of God. John the Apostle said, if we say that we have no sin, he said, then we make God a liar and the truth is not in us. Got news for you. In John's epistle, he went right into a bunch of unsaved people. 
He was writing to the church. He was telling believers, if we, 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 notice he used the word we. When you read in your New Testament, when you read the words we or us, that is generally without fail talking about the church or believers. Because when it's talking about the world, it will always say them and they. But the Apostle John said, if we say that we have no sin, then the truth is not in us. No, when you're born again, honey, you're still going to have imperfections. Got news for you. You're still going to have sin in your life. You're still going to struggle with things. That's what grace is about. That's why you've got to keep your faith intact and keep believing God. Keep trusting His Word. Keep trusting His grace. Keep believing His promise that in our weakness He is strong. The church has long preached to the unbeliever that if they will come to Christ and be saved, suddenly everything about them and everything in their world will change. And it will become all that God desires it to be. Baloney. According to many, conversion results or should result according to them in perfection and sinlessness. But this wasn't Paul's experience. In spite of his powerful and dramatic Damascus Road conversion, he still had issues in his life which he was, listen, completely unable to overcome. Don't tell me if you pray hard enough, God will change you, brother. If you pray hard enough, God will change you. You're a liar, devil. You're a liar. Paul, the apostle, had a conversion experience on the road to Damascus that was more powerful and more pronounced, uh, profound than anything any one of us have ever experienced. And yet even Paul said, now i got this devil in my life that I can't get rid of. I went to the Lord three times, asked Him to deliver me, and His answer came back, nope, my grace is sufficient for you. Mm -hmm. So don't tell me. When you're converted, you're suddenly sinless. So don't tell me when you're converted, you're suddenly perfect. That isn't what Paul experienced. And honey, if that isn't an example of a miraculous conversion experience, I don't know what is. Rather than the Lord giving Paul the power and the strength to overcome his issue, he instead admonished Paul, listen to me, to learn to accept that issue and accept his grace, understanding that in his weakness, the power and strength of God's grace is strongest. The power God has promised believers... In Acts 1 and 8, the Word of God declares, But ye shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you. Listen. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The power that God has promised believers is not the power to attain perfection, or to live sinlessly, but rather the power needed to preach and disseminate the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are assured that we have the power to overcome any obstacles or obstructions the enemy may place before us as we seek to perform the most essential task of the church which is evangelism. That's what that power is for. Luke chapter 10 is devoted to the Lord's instructions regarding 
evangelism and the preaching of the gospel. It's within that context that the Lord then said, Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you power to tread on scorpions, on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Read Luke 10. Read it in context. The entire chapter the Lord is instructing His apostles on preaching and evangelizing. And it's within that context that He says, I give you power over all the works of the, of the enemy. See how easy it is to pull something out of context and use it in a way that it ought not to be used because it's not right. At the very end of Mark's telling of the gospel, the Lord commands His disciples to preach. And then He expounds upon the power which would be displayed as the endorsement of God upon their work. In Mark 16, 15, 18, And He, Jesus, said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. All that Saul knew was the law. His mindset was works-based salvation. He understood nothing of God's grace as he was instructed from his youth to follow every edict and every mandate of the law. Many believers today still have a mindset that is based in law. Many believers today still believe that their salvation is entirely dependent upon their ability to do all that is, in their mind at least, required of them by the Lord. But the Word of God clearly states in Galatians 5, 1 through 5, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, referring to the law, the requirements of the law, if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Now listen to verse 4. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. See, Saul, all he knew was the law. That Damascus Road encounter was to get his eyes off the law and to turn them to grace. I've got news for you, believer. There are some of you watching right now. You need a Damascus Road encounter. You need to have a Damascus Road encounter. I'm going to tell you something. God will find a way to stop you dead in your tracks and make you look up toward heaven because all of a sudden, everything you thought you knew, you don't know. Everything you thought you understand, you're going to find out you don't understand. I'm going to tell you, there's more grief and more trouble and more woe that comes into the life of God's people because they don't get this thing straight. They don't understand this thing right. 
And when you don't understand this thing right, I want to tell you something. God has to send experience after experience after experience to rock your world and make you rethink His grace and make you rethink what you know about Him. And there are people, Tommy, that will have Damascus Road on top of Damascus Road on top of Damascus Road experience, and they still never learn. Mm -hmm. As a believer, as a child of God, growing up as a Christian, as a young person, my life was so tumultuous. I did so many dumb things. I had so many struggles. And now, understanding God the way I understand Him today, I look back and realize, if I'd have had preaching like you've got right now, if I'd have grown up on this kind of preaching, there's so many mistakes. There's so many things I wouldn't have done. There's so many things I wouldn't have experienced. I wouldn't have needed them. God was trying to help me understand His grace, but every time I just felt like I was falling further and further away from the mandate of the law. I just felt like I was falling further and further away. Boy, I'm really missing the mark. I'm really, missing, oh, I'm missing the mark even worse than it was yesterday. Now today, oh God, I'm really lost. Well, I'm going to hit hell on grease skids. My God, Lord Jesus, you're going to set me on fire before I even hit hell. I'm missing the mark. And all the while, the Lord trying to tell me, hey, 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 hey. Why don't you quit thinking you know everything? Start asking me about some things. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. My Lord, have mercy. Saul had to learn that for a child of God to be married to the gospel, to be married to Christ, we must first allow the law to die. We cannot merely divorce the law because our commitment to the law would still remain until the day we died. But for us to be free to marry Christ, we must allow the law to die. In Romans chapter 7 verses 1 through 4, the word of God reads, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, Paul says. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, he's using this as a metaphor. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You can't be married to Jesus and still be committed and married to the law. And I tell the truth. Right. Amen. You can't have it both ways, folks. You can't be married to the law and married to the Lord. Lastly, today, while many of us struggle with and resent those issues which cause us to rethink our relationship with God and our understanding of His grace, the truth is, we can't possibly be saved without them. Everyone must come to an understanding of grace mm -hmm. so they can release their devotion to the law. Mm -hmm. Every born-again believer must, as I said at the beginning of my message, must at some point have a Damascus Road moment. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I hope that...